Okay, so we're going to start with some basics. So tonight we're talking about menopause and perimenopause. So we're just going to jump right in and start with a couple of um, definitions. Oh, that's me. Just in case you'll have these slides later and it will also be recorded. So if you want to find our contact information or anything else that we have in the slides, you can do that later at any time. Um, so menopause is a natural transition. This is just the end of an era. It happens to everyone. Um, all living women. It is the definition is just the ceasing of menstruation. So the clinical time period is 12 months. If you go 12 months without a period, you are said to officially be in menopause. So menopause is really a point in time, whereas perimenopause. Oh, and before we get to that, a little note on just there's kind of two different types. There's the natural menopause, which happens slowly over time, usually a gradually over many years. And then surgical menopause can happen if someone has a hysterectomy that removes both ovaries, or if they've gone through chemotherapy or radiation for cancer treatment, that will often also um, put a woman into sudden menopause. And the symptoms associated with surgical menopause can be quite severe and very sudden versus natural menopause where things are just a little slower and more gradual and we have more time to intervene. And then perimenopause is that transition zone. So that can be any time from mid 30s onward. Typical is about mid 40s to mid 50s. Um, menopause, I think average age is around 51. Um, and that shift in hormones is natural. Hormones start to decrease and it can be with or without external symptoms. We often associate it as always, you know, you have to feel these things, but it doesn't have to be life altering. So I just thought this was funny, um, a little comic that I found online, Happy World Menopause Day. I'd celebrate, but shoot, what was I saying? Is it hot in here or is it me? Now, where did I leave that glass of wine? So I wanted to put that in because it gives a lot of symptoms right in that funny little um, comic. Some of the common symptoms is this by no means an exhaustive list. But weight gain, especially belly fat that just doesn't go away no matter how much um, diet changes or exercise you do. Hair loss or thinning, drying, dry and thinning skin, hot flashes and chills. We talk a lot about hot flashes, but there can be temperature regulation issues in general. Um, night sweats, insomnia, you can read through these, but these are the big ones. Memory issues is huge. Um, ups and downs in mood changes, kind of both anxiety and depression or one or the other frequent urination. Some people have all of them. Some people just have a few. Some people really have none. So I also found this in my research that about 80% of women experience most commonly hot flashes and night sweats. I would say probably other symptoms as well. And for a lot of people, they're manageable. But for many people, these symptoms really negatively impact their life, um, their sleep, their mood, and their overall quality of life. And we're going to talk a little bit about tonight about what you can do about that now on your own. And one thing I want to mention is that um, there's inevitable things that are just happen to everyone no matter what, and then there's common. And I think when we talk about menopause and perimenopause, symptoms are very common, especially in the United States, but they're not inevitable. It's, you don't have to go through all of these symptoms when you're in perimenopause or postmenopause. And when we think of symptoms in the body, and I think Alexis will touch on this when she talks about homeopathy as well, that any symptom that we can point to or talk about is a sign of imbalance of some sort internally. And those imbalances can be corrected in a whole lot of different ways. And one of the big ones that um, I think we both use is diet and lifestyle are kind of the foundation of that. And just keeping in mind that this is a normal transition, so there's no inevitable, fated, determined, um, situation where you have to have all of these symptoms or any of them. You know, Sangeeta, Kimberly had a question, which is, which I think you partially just answered just now, but maybe you could speak a little mm -hmm. more to, is there a reason that some people have a lot of symptoms and some people don't? Yes. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that. Okay. Good. So a lot of what I'm going to go over tonight is why some people have more symptoms than others and, and how you can determine for yourself what might be causing those symptoms. So we're going to talk about prevention, things you can do if you're in your 20s, 30s, or 40s. If you're already in menopause, we'll talk about that too. 
about things you can do if you're already having symptoms. Um, so just a reminder, you, I'm not going to go over these two pictures in depth, but just a reminder that really we're talking about estrogen and progesterone at the core of tonight's talk. So those are the two hormones, as well as testosterone to a lesser degree. But the change in these two hormones over time, usually over about a decade, um, slowly uh, they both decrease together. Estrogen gets a lot of press. If you look at these, and you can look at them a little more closely um, later, you'll see that they both have a lot of good qualities. So we need both hormones in a proper ratio, not equal. There's typically more estrogen than progesterone at any given time, except during pregnancy. But we do need them both, and they both have a lot of positive effects in the body. But one common thing and why some people might have more symptoms than other is what we call estrogen dominance. Um, it's very common. You've probably heard that term thrown around. And it's, it's called dominance because it's a relative term. It's not a particular level of estrogen. It just means that your estrogen levels are high in comparison to your progesterone. So both total levels could be too low, but with estrogen still being higher than progesterone. And that estrogen dominance, too much estrogen without anything to balance it, causes a lot of these symptoms we talked about, especially the vasomotor symptoms, the hot, the cold, the night sweats, that sort of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons why someone might have estrogen dominance, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, it has a lot more to do with the entire body, not just the female hormones, but the liver and gallbladder and the digestive system or the gut are vital to this process. They're really important at keeping estrogen in its place, so to speak. Um, and what you really need to do is figure out what's causing the imbalance. And if you can correct that imbalance, you'll often give the body space or room to balance hormones on its own. We just have to intervene um, in the right place and with the right things to give the body the support it needs and it will often do the rest on its own. The body's pretty amazing in that, in that regard. So some of the lifestyle factors that might create estrogen dominance or just or create low progesterone or various other things that lead to symptoms are stress. I put these in order sort of of how important I think they are. So stress is a huge one. Um, ongoing, low-grade, chronic stress or big bouts of you know, intense stress that last for a period of time and go away. All stress impacts our entire system, including hormone production. Sleep as part of that stress picture. So if we're not getting good, regular sleep over long periods of time, that can also impact how well we make hormones. Diet's important, but not just what we're eating, but also how we eat, when we eat. And I will add to that also who we eat with is important. Um, exercise. Exercise gets a lot of press compared to some of these other things. And although exercise is important, I put it a little lower down on the list because it's sort of, I think of it as the adjunct that really helps, but alone it's not enough. You really have to have the other pieces. Um, and then the last two, hormonal birth control, especially when it's taken for many, many, many years on end, uh, it, the way it works is to prevent ovulation uh, and it prevents the body from releasing eggs. And when you do that, you naturally disrupt the levels of estrogen and progesterone. So over long periods of time, that can lead to hormone imbalance. And then any kind of chronic health issue, and I'm going to mention this a little bit more at the end, but really any chronic health issue that anything that's chronic involves inflammation. And so chronic inflammatory conditions of all kinds will impact our hormonal production and will tend to make menopausal and perimenopausal symptoms worse. So really addressing those issues as soon as they come up and um, getting them under control will go a long way. So these are some of the key players besides the ovaries, which produce eggs, produce estrogen and progesterone. These are kind of the three areas. This is also not everything, but the adrenal glands often get overlooked um, in favor of thyroid glands. Thyroid is important as well, but adrenal and thyroid work together. Um, and, and there's a common pathway I'm going to show you in a moment that adrenal glands produce cortisol and that pathway is shared with progesterone and some other hormones. So they're really important. They're also our stress glands. So it links right back to how stress can really impact hormone production. 
liver and gallbladder have a lot to do with how well we absorb nutrients and uh, how well we detox, detoxify things as well as break down and build hormones. So also vitally important. And they are part of the digestive system. Uh, and the di digestive system here, in addition to liver and gallbladder, I mean stomach, pancreas, small intestine, large intestine, the rest of the apparatus. Um, digestive system really is the foundation of everything. This is where we build neurotransmitters, we absorb all of our nutrients, we help bind up waste and get rid of it. So you really want to, over the course of your life, make sure that your digestive system is as healthy as possible. So that's sort of the basics, and then we're gonna get a little bit into prevention and treatment. This is gonna be a bit of a quick whirlwind, so <laughs> please, I stuffed a lot into these slides. So if you have specific questions, I know people might have questions about specific doses of supplements and whatnot, so please drop them in the chat or make a note to yourself and we'll try and get to those at the end. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We've all heard that, and it really is kind of the mantra of naturopathic and alternative medicine. So much of what we do is educate our patients to help prevent things from occurring in the first place. And so in terms of perimenopause and menopause, what we want to prevent are all those nasty symptoms we saw at the beginning. And some ways to do that, we'll get a little more into specifics here soon, but you want to support the ovaries and all those key players I mentioned. You want to start as early as you can. So start wherever you're at, but if you're in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, definitely that's where prevention um, has the most um, impact. But you can adjust your lifestyle at any age. So it doesn't really matter where you're at in this um, system. You can always make changes that will help. And also to remember that we're treating the whole body, even though we're talking about one particular area tonight, we're talking about the physical body, the energy body, the mind, the emotions, the nervous system, all of it. So it's, it's all part of the process. And also this is, and anything we talk about is really a lifelong practice of good health, not a quick fix. So we do want, as, as a physician, I want people to feel better and I want to quickly fix their symptoms, but I also want it to be a lifelong practice of good health. So to go back to, we're going to go through some of the hormones and some of the key players with some tips on things you can do to make yourself, um, to start wherever you're at. So female hormones are produced, estrogen is produced in the ovaries and the fat tissue. So most women in menopause gain a little bit of belly fat. Part of that is that belly fat and fat tissue in general produces a little estrogen. There are three main forms of estrogen. Estradiol is the most common when we're in our fertile period of life. And then as we get older, we produce more estrone and estriol, which are just a little less strong in their effect in the body. Progesterone is also produced by the ovaries at ovulation. So as that egg swells and gets ready to be released, progesterone is, is produced in that process. And then in peri and postmenopause, and this is going to become really important in the prevention side of things, uh, the adrenal glands very slowly over time start to take up some of that progesterone production that's lost by the ovaries. And that's why the gradual um, movement toward menopause allows the adrenal glands time to kind of pick up that extra duty, provided they're not too fatigued or strained from external stressors or internal stressors. And then female hormones are impacted by all of the other hormones, the entire endocrine or hormonal system. So pituitary, pineal gland, thyroid, adrenal, they all play a part. And I didn't put in any of my favorite flow charts this time because it gets very complicated. But just keep in mind that the hormonal system is one unit. They're not separate. So here's some of the things that I'm sure you've seen out there in the world. These are just some of my favorite things that I use with people. So Vitex or Chase Tree is a great progesteronic herb. It really helps to promote, um, even in younger women, um, proper length of cycles, um, easier menses, less sweeting, less heavy, but regularity especially because it helps with progesterone production. Black cohosh, on the other hand, is a little bit more estrogenic. Um, and maca is one of my favorites. Maca is kind of an all-around adaptogen for the adrenal glands, and it also helps balance hormones. It's a little more on the estrogenic side, but it helps with both. Um, some of the most important vitamins are B vitamins. The fat solubles, oh, I put D on here twice, oops. All the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and magnesium. 
which B vitamins are used up a lot under stress, internal or external stress. Uh, so those are really important. And then nutrients, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids tend to be anti-inflammatory, so those are very important. Cholesterol and healthy dietary fats. You have to have fat to make hormones. So low-fat diets um, are detrimental to hormone production. And then my favorite, the adrenal glands. So these little guys, those tiny little things sitting on top of the kidneys, um, as I mentioned before, they supplement progesterone production, especially as we get into perimenopause and beyond. They actually swell sometimes to two or three times their size in postmenopausal women, and that's normal. They produce cortisol and adrenaline and various other things, but cortisol is kind of the big one that helps us um, manage our inflammatory state, and it helps us with energy, sleep metabol sleep regulation, energy metabolism, and it works with the thyroid gland. You have to have properly functioning adrenal glands in order to make and transform thyroid hormone. So those two are intimately connected. You can't have one without the other. So one little chart I had to throw in, and don't get too overwhelmed by this, but this is one of the reasons stress is so important when you get into perimenopause. So this is called a cortisol steel, or sometimes it's called progesterone. I think it really should be progesterone steel, because you can see where cholesterol is up there at the top, in the left-hand corner. You have, every hormone is made on a cholesterol backbone. So if your cholesterol is too low, and I would say for women that is below 180 is really too low or anywhere from 170 to 180 is, is good and, and higher in menopausal women over 200 is not a problem but that cholesterol then becomes various hormones but you throw stress right in there where pregnenolone becomes progesterone and suddenly the body turns all of that progesterone into cortisol and cortisone which is a more inflammatory version of cortisol so what you're left with is not enough progesterone and that can be part of the estrogen dominance. If your progesterone is being stolen and used up, it's going to make your whatever estrogen is there um, look higher in proportion. So stress is really something we need to manage as early on as we can. And then some ways we can do that in addition to good habits. So the adrenal glands love regularity and schedule. Go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time, eat at the same time exercise regularly to your capacity. So don't overdo it either. Too much exercise, if it's too much for you, can actually inhibit um, adrenal production of hormones or cause them to overact and you don't wanna do that. Um, and then sleeping at least eight hours a night, more if you're tired or sick. And then some other external things you can do. So there's a lot of adaptogenic herbs, which just means that they're herbs that help balance the adrenal system. They don't necessarily stimulate or downregulate. They do both. Ashwagandha is the big one that everyone has heard of. Um, I would caution people, anyone who is prone toward irritability, frustration, or depression, be wary of too much ashwagandha. It's a very hot and heavy herb, and it can aggravate those things. But if you're a little more prone to being jittery and anxious and not sleeping well, ashwagandha can be your very best friend. Um, some others you've probably heard of, rhodiola, Siberian and American ginseng, also called Eleutherococcus, the Siberian version. Cordyceps, schizandra, licorice is great. Um, too much licorice can elevate blood pressure, so be careful of that. These often come in combo formulas. I have my favorites I can share with people later if you want, my favorite brands. And then there's actual glandulars that just like thyroid hormone, natural thyroid hormone that comes from usually porcine or um, pork thyroid from pigs. Uh, glandulars come from animals, usually pig or cow, and it actually supplies you cortisol if you're deficient. And I would only recommend doing that if you've been tested, but it can really make people feel better if they're severely deficient and their adrenals are really fatigued. And it can give them a little bit of rest while they repair. And then sleep support, which as I mentioned, really is stress support. Sleep is when we rejuvenate, um, refuel, the body takes care of mild oxidative damage and restores everything, kind of a reset for the next day. And these are just some of my favorite sleep things. And I don't use them necessarily all together. I pick and choose depending on um, what someone needs. So melatonin, everyone knows about. 
there's quick acting, quick acting or sustained. Quick acting is the, if you have trouble falling asleep, it's metabolized very quickly within the first four hours. And then sustained release gives you a little boost initially and another one about four hours later. So it helps when you can't stay asleep. GABA, theanine, 5-HTP, magnesium are all calming to the muscles, to the brain, to the body. Um, and they can also help people to stay asleep if waking up is an issue. Phosphatidylserine is one of my very favorites. Um, it helps to decrease excess cortisol. So if your adrenal glands are pumping out too much cortisol while you sleep, while you sleep, which is what we don't want, this naturally helps to take that down, which allows you to sleep through the night. And I put my basic dose there that I use. And then some of my favorite herbs in order, skullcap and motherwort, motherwort I put first because I love them. Um, they're calming soothing to the mind, they help calm anxiety, they help actually, skullcap actually help calm the vagus nerve, which is our nerve that likes to be relaxed, mm -hmm. that innervates all of our organs. Valerian is a little bit more sedating, but I do use it in pretty high dose if people really have trouble sleeping. And then some of the gentler passion flower and chamomile are really just calming herbs, they're very gentle, good, good with children. And then just remembering good sleep hygiene, and I'm not gonna go over that, but I think everyone knows, you know, make sure you're in a quiet room, not too hot, not too cold, that it's dark, no screens or phones for an hour before bed, and try to go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, even on weekends. Uh, and then moving into kind of our more detox organs, the liver and gallbladder work together as a team. You can see in the picture how the gallbladder is kind of really embedded right in the liver, right behind it. This helps us digest fats. And as I mentioned before, fats are incredibly necessary for hormone production. So we wanna make sure we're absorbing them and getting them to where they need to go. It helps us to bind toxins. So even if we live in the cleanest house and we eat the cleanest food, we're all exposed to toxins. And so the liver's always binding things. Can we go no back for what. one second, Sangeeta? Yeah. Um, somebody has a question about how, what is best to help staying asleep. Sorry to jump back to sleep for a second. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question, but um, it really depends on the person. I know nobody likes this answer. <laughs> so there are lots and lots of reasons why someone might not be sleeping. Um, and the way that I determine this is to look at their whole stress pattern during the day and at night. Because I don't know that, my general recommendation would be to try sustained release melatonin. Three milligrams is the physiologic dose. Um, you can go up to six. It doesn't impede your own production of melatonin. So even though it's a hormone, it doesn't turn off your body's own production, which some other hormones do. But everyone has varying reactions to melatonin. And if it doesn't work on one night, you should still take it nightly for a month to see if you get any response. And then phosphatidylserine and some kind of product that's a mix of GABA, theanine, and 5-HTP if there is anxiety or feeling revved up at night. Even if they're able to fall asleep, if they wake up in the middle of the night feeling revved up or their mind instantly turns on, GABA, theanine, and 5-HTP are great for that. Um, so kind of all of these, really. I know I didn't really answer your question with one thing. Um, you know, I have a suggestion to add in there to answer yeah. that question. It's something that I learned pretty recently, and it's helped several of my clients a lot, which is to eat something very specific right before bed, because sometimes, sometimes the reason that people are waking up is that um, the brain has run out of fuel, and mm -hmm. so it stimulates cortisol production in order to get you up and getting some food and then you know from a caveman perspective right. and then you're awake so something that's worked really well is to have a teaspoon of honey before bed or uh, some mct oil before bed or some collagen before bed and i've had people try combi you can do two of the three or one of the three or all three and see what works for you and that's something else to try to offer your brain fuel throughout the night so that it doesn't need to wake you up in order to stimulate you to get some fuel for it yeah and if there's a blood sugar issue or that's why it's really 
often patient specific. I do a lot of gut disorder treatment and um, my general rule of thumb is to not eat after seven o'clock, that you really wanna let your body have at least three hours between dinner and bedtime. But that also is dependent on eating regular meals and making sure those meals are proper for you. So it really does come down to, are you eating the right diet and getting the right nutrients throughout the day? Um, and is that affecting your blood sugar? But I, I agree, Alexis, that that can be helpful. But if that is the case, and that's the reason someone's not staying asleep, I would still look at a little deeper and figure out why that's happening. I agree with that. And, and I just want to clarify that I also don't think you should eat after seven. And this would be not, it would be a spoonful, not, not a right. meal by any means. And then Kimberly wants to know, are there any brands that recommend to combine those, but I'm not, I don't think she's talking about what I said. I think she's talking about what you said, like with the phosphatidylserine and um, yeah, so there are a oh, lot theanine. of, she says theanine. Yeah, so there's one brand that off the top of my head that I can think of that I use a lot. It's called, the, the label is called Zen Sleep. It's by Allergy Research Group. A lot of the brands that I use are doctor-only brands, and so you can't find them retail. You have to um, get them through a doctor. Um, but I can also give people ways to order them. But there are lots of different companies that make combinations of these, and there probably are retail brands. You just have to, they'd be in the sleep section. You just have to look at the labels. And there are some that have phosphatidylserine in them as well, but often only about 50 milligrams. And I find if people do have pretty revved up cortisol levels at night that you need at least 100, 100 to 150 to start with and as much as 300 at bedtime. Uh, but sleep is a very complicated, I mean, Alexis and I were talking about doing a sleep webinar because sleep is such a big deal. <laughs> and I think maybe at some point we'll do that because we could talk about sleep all day long. <laughs> it's so important. Um, so going back to the liver and gallbladders, this is much more about building hormones, breaking them down, detoxifying from various chemicals, metals, whatever it might be, and recycling things, including cholesterol and bile. So as the gallbladder produces bile, which I didn't put on here, bile is our natural binder. It's going to bind up to used. Up, it's going to bind to used up hormones that have done their job and they're now ready to be excreted. It'll also bind to any chemicals or toxins and help carry them out of the body. But the body's very protective of its bile supply, so it will. There's a thing called enterohepatic recirculation. Big fancy word for basically things in the small intestine get recycled back to the liver. And the problem with that is if there is a lot of toxicity in the body that bile will get taken back to the liver with whatever it's carrying. And that can include, in this case, used up estrogen. And if we take back um, de deactivated estrogen, it will sort of get lumped into the pile, but it won't be useful. It won't actually be doing anything. That can add to estrogen dominance. Um, so we really wanna make sure that our liver and gallbladder is detoxifying um, the best it can. These are just some of my favorite things that I use. Different herbs that promote liver repair, that promote like chelidonium is a bile producer. It's called a cholagog. It helps the bile to produce, or the gallbladder to produce bile. Um, you can actually supplement with ox bile. For people who don't have a gallbladder, you definitely want to do that because otherwise you won't be digesting fat. And tudka is a, a, a shortened word for this big long thing that I'm not even going to try to say. T doxy, rugo, something, something. <laughs> this big, long word um, that helps activate bile salts. And I've found it recently to be really useful when there's a lot of toxicity in the body. And then um, binders. Sorry, one more question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you think of heavy metal testing? Should you do it or maybe just skip it and detox anyway? So I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the very end, okay. um, but the, about digging deeper because um, if the things we're talking about here, kind of these are sort of the things I like to give people that you could go out and try on your own to improve detoxification. But if these things don't work and you're still having hormonal symptoms, then you're going to want to look a little deeper. And that is one of the things on my list. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, binders all have different specificity. They bind different things. So it really depends what you want to bind. But activated charcoal is a good generalized one, especially for gut bloating and gases and feeling nauseous. 
Um, but binders just help grab onto that bile that's holding whatever it's holding, use up hormones or toxins, and helps pull it out of the body. So they're really important if you are detoxifying from something. Um, and then this sounds a little counterintuitive, but you do want to have plenty of good fats in your diet to supply the liver with the tools or the foundational pieces that it needs to build things. Because it's not only the organ of breaking down and detoxifying, it's also the organ that builds things out of proteins and amino acids and cholesterol for hormones. So we really, really want to make sure that the, the liver has what it needs and that we're digesting them properly. And Sangeeta, we have another question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I missed this earlier. How do you know if you have liver gallbladder issues? Is there certain testing you do to figure that out? Or are there certain symptoms that you have that would let you know that's a problem? Well, any hormonal symptom um, could potentially be liver congestion or liver um, that one of the detoxification pathways isn't working quite right. So any of the symptoms we've talked about in perimenopause could be due to some of that. Also, if someone has historically had painful periods, difficult periods, irregular cycles, things like that, that can also be liver related. Um, and then if there is a toxic burden in the body, if someone does have mycotoxins or heavy metals or infections, and the liver is just overburdened by having to do a lot, um, there are symptoms in that regard that might indicate the liver needs more support. And those those are kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight, but they have to do more with um, to feeling toxic. So headaches, digestive issues, body aches and pains, things that have to do with a, a backup of toxicity. Um, I tend to do liver support in a lot of my protocols for various things because it, it's such an overburdened organ most of the time anyways. And things like milk thistles are really good for everyone. They protect the hepatocytes or the cells in the liver from damage, um, which is, I think, something that most of us could use. So as part of that liver gallbladder system, we also include the rest of the digestive system, stomach, intestines, large intestine, small intestine. Um, and we want to make sure that our food is actually being broken down well into smaller pieces. That starts in the stomach, and stomach acid is really important. Having proper stomach acid delivered at the proper time with meals, and this is where regularity of meals is really important, and also stress. Um, increased stress, especially when we're sitting down to eat or that um, impacts our ability to stop and eat, will cause our stomach to not produce um, ample stomach acid, and then that causes all kinds of downstream effects, um, including lack of absorption of nutrients. If things aren't broken down well at the beginning, they're going to be too big for the small intestine to absorb, and then the body won't have those basic building blocks it needs to build things like hormones and various other things. Um, and then a lot of that binding I talked about with bile actually happens in the small intestine. That's where the recirculation happens. So we want to make sure to support that detoxification in the small intestine. And then also in the small intestine, we make most of the body's neurotransmitters. So serotonin, dopamine, all of those, about 70 to some people say 90% of serotonin is made in the small intestine. And there's so much more. I could do a whole three hour webinar on the gut, but um, really, really important in so many processes in the body. So things we can do to support just in general. So if you have digestive symptoms, that's a different picture. And we would want to investigate that and figure out what it is and remove those things. But in general, for people who feel pretty healthy and just want to tone things up, um, this is good for everyone. You want to eat regular meals, like I mentioned. Try to eat at roughly the same time every day. Leave about three to four hours between meals with just water or liquids so that you allow the small intestine to flush itself out and clean itself out between meals. Make sure you're relaxed and chewing slowly and thoroughly. These are all simple things that even I need reminding, you know, to take the time to just allow your body to be relaxed while you're eating. It really, really helps with stomach acid production and, and digestion and absorption. Um, and then one simple thing I love to do with a lot of my patients is bitters. Um, these are some of my favorite herbs that I use. So bitters before meals, you put a little on your tongue and that bitter taste that kind of makes you salivate and cringe a little bit, causes the brain to tell the stomach that food is coming and produce more stomach acid. And you really want your stomach to be full of acid 
before food hits it. That's going to support proper digestion. So gentian was also on the liver herb page. It's a great stimulator of bile and stimulator of stomach acid. Um, kind of my basic, and I didn't make this up, this is an old formula for bitters, but gentian, skullcap, and ginger in the various ratios. Um, wormwood, if people need something a little bit more cooling, dandelion, dandelion, artichoke, there's lots of others, but these are the most bitter on the list. And bitters should be really bitter. They should taste kind of bad. They should make you salivate. And you just put one drop of it on your tongue? Is that, it's not like a whole drink? I usually put, I have people do it to their tolerance, but um, five to 10 drops directly on the tongue and you want to you want to taste it. The important part is you want to taste the bitterness. Once you've tasted it, then you can rinse it down with some water. Um, you can also do it if you have heartburn, reflux, nausea, anything like that. You can do the same thing, five to 10 drops just in the moment. I make these in my office in Mill Valley because I don't, I don't like commercial bitters. I think they're too sweet. Um, I like them to be very, very bitter. They're great to just carry around with you. Um, and then daily bowel movements. Um, this is something I talk a lot about with my patients, but you really want to be having one good, well-formed, solid, complete bowel movement, at least one. Um, if there's toxins going on or you need to detox more than, you know, one, two, three, four, as long as they're well-formed, it's great. But at least once a day to make sure we're getting all those toxins and used up hormones and stuff out of the body. And then... a. a a little talk about hormones, because I know this is a lot of times where um, perimenopause and menopause talks go, is about hormone replacement therapy. So I do this not as often as probably some other doctors, but if you have tried everything and you feel like you want to go down this route, make sure you test, do a full hormone panel testing, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second, and take bioidentical hormones if possible. They are compounded and often a little more expensive but they are well worth it. They're designed to look exactly like our own innate hormones. So the body processes them very well. And people having really severe symptoms often feel a lot better from this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be forever. If we're correcting underlying imbalances, it might be temporary, but they've also been proven in low dose to be taken safely over time. And just a couple brief things I wanna mention about that. Estrogen should not be taken orally. Estrogen and testosterone, um, are best taken paired together in a cream that you can put on any soft skin. Um, my boss, Dr. Brent at Be Well, always had women do it um, on the vulva skin, so not in, intravaginally, but just in that softer skin. She says it's best absorbed there. And it helps directly, the estrogen helps directly when it's applied locally like that with dryness and thin tissues. Progesterone can be done topical or oral. Oral progesterone also helps with sleep. So women often take 100 to 200 milligrams of bioidentical progesterone at night. And sometimes that's enough to control hot flashes. You don't actually need to add estrogen, especially if there's already estrogen dominance. Progesterone is wonderful stuff when people need it. Um, it's why pregnant women look so glowy and healthy. <laughs> So this is a little just reminder of step-by-step. Step. You wanna start with prevention wherever you're at. Do all the things to support your overall health. Test yourself, and I'm gonna mention this a little more in a minute, uh, but you really wanna get the whole picture. If you're doing hormone testing, you wanna do a full panel. Treat yourself with, that, with diet, lifestyle, herbs, supplements, or find a practitioner, and then bioidentical hormones if you need them. And if you find you're still having symptoms, whether it's hormonal or otherwise, then that's when you want to dig a little bit deeper into toxins and infections to see if there's another underlying cause that's impacting your hormone production. And this is really what I do in my practice mostly is chronic complex illness. Um, this is kind of my fun place. Um, if you're doing complete hormone testing, and I would absolutely recommend this, you want to do a full adrenal panel. This is typically, in, in my world, a salivary test. Cortisol, DHEA sulfate, and melatonin at the minimum, but there are other things that some panels will test, um, including progesterone and sometimes gluten antibodies. A full thyroid panel, this is just a blood draw, so these are the things that I would include in a full um, thyroid panel. 
there are two thyroid antibodies you want to look at, thyroperoxidase and thyroglobulin. And then a female hormone panel can be blood, urine, or saliva. All doctors have their preference. I use them all depending on the situation. If you're doing a blood panel, you want to make sure to do the blood draw in the luteal phase or the second half of your cycle when hormones are the highest. So if people have a standard 28 or longer cycle, if it's a 28 day cycle, you want to do the blood draw somewhere between day 21 and 25 um, or a little later if your cycles are longer. And you want to look at all estrogens if you're in menopause, if you're already in menopause or very close, you know, very perimenopause, close to menopause, you want to look at estrone, estriol, and estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone free in total. We have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you like the Dutch test or prefer a different adrenal panel? Um, I don't use Dutch test a lot for adrenal. The Dutch test is very thorough. That's one of the dried urine tests that you, they also do female hormones. So typically when you do a Dutch panel, you get everything you could ever want and more. Um, it's a little more than I typically do. They can be very, very useful because they give you metabolites. So they don't just give you progesterone, but they give you all the different things that progesterone breaks down into. And this is often really useful when people are on hormone replacement because you can see how well the body's actually processing the hormones you're giving it. I don't think that the Dutch test is always necessary for everyone. Sometimes it can be a little over the top and there are simpler, cheaper tests depending on what the person needs. But it's a so good time. Someone's asking what adrenal panel would you use? Uh, so my personal preference, the one that I use a lot is by a company called Labrix. Um, actually Labrix and doctor's data are combined together. And because I can pick and choose what I want, they have different adrenal plant panels. But the standard panel that I run is cortisol, DHEA, um, and melatonin, and then something called a cortisol awakening response, um, which is three samples in the morning that gives you an idea of how well your adrenal glands are responding. You know, are they so tired that they're just not responding at all? Or are they at least giving a little normal response? Um, and you can add on to that test. So you can do all the estrogens, progesterone. So I like their hormone testing, but there are a lot of other good labs. BRT does it, the Dutch test. Um, there's lots of them out there. And the science is similar with all the tests. Um, practitioners just have their favorites. I've used Labrix for years. I just like them. Um, and then the other big piece, if you're, you're still not getting better, and especially if you have symptoms in other areas of your body as well, um, I always look at, I call it toxin, toxin and infection burden. And sometimes these are very stealthy and they're hard to diagnose, but mycotoxins, which come from mold spores, are more prevalent and common than we think. And if you are genetically sensitive to them, they can build up in your system and wreak a lot of havoc on hormones and immune, system, immune function. Heavy metals, as someone mentioned. I don't do a lot of heavy metal detoxification. I feel like it's kind of a specialty. If people really have a lot of heavy metals, I often refer them out, but it can absolutely be part of the problem. Same with glyphosate and other chemicals in our environment. Um, and there's a company called Great Plains that does a great toxin panel profile if people think they have those sorts of chemical exposures. And then gut diet dysbiosis of any kind, so SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, yeast overgrowth, or other fungal overgrowth and intestinal parasites, which are much more common than people think. Uh, those can also play a big part in hormonal symptoms. And then the, the big infections, the big stealthy infections, Lyme disease and co-infections, which are many. Um, mycoplasma, which is a Lyme disease co-infection, but I gave it its own line because I've seen a lot of it in California this year. Um, and it just has its own special thing that it does in the body and it can really mess with our immune function. And then Epstein-Barr, which everyone's heard of, mono, and then lots of other viruses. And I don't often find viruses to be the biggest problem, but if you see a lot of them, it can mean that the immune system is overwhelmed and you need to look a little deeper. So there's tests for all these things, um, and really it's a clinical diagnosis when things aren't getting better and you just need to dig a little deeper. Um, I do have a question about that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what stool or gut test is your favorite? Oh, geez. 
<laughs> I am always in search of the perfect stool test, and so far I have not found one. Um, for the moment, I have settled on the GI360 from Doctors Data um, as the one that I use most often. But I also use GI Maps and Diagnostic Solutions on occasion. Um, sometimes I'll do just yeast profiles with Doctors Data. I also use the stool test called Gut Zoomer from Vibrant Wellness on occasion. Um, those are those are kind of the big ones, but it kind of depends on the person and what I suspect. And with, with parasites and yeast, I often will just treat based on clinical suspicion. Um, and if it's SIBO, if I think it's SIBO, then I'll just jump straight to a breath test. And I, I tend to use um, Commonwealth for them or aerodiagnostics. Um, yeah, and there's a new one that just came out that also tests for hydrogen sulfide SIBO. So we just started using that one too. But again, just kind of my preferences. Um, so when talking about other testing, this is just kind of the general, you know, you're really looking at removing the obstacles to cure. So if someone's not getting better, you've got to figure out what those things are and get them out of the way. Find someone who's knowledgeable in the area that you're looking to do testing and someone who has clinical understanding of complex pictures. And then do proper and thorough testing, which doesn't mean you need to do every test. Some people just run everything, gets very expensive. You want to pick the ones that are most relevant for you. And then when you do find a treatment, you want to stick to that treatment for an adequate period of time, which in my book is usually six to 12 months. If people have been sick a long time, it can be two years um, or longer. Don't forget about the rest of the body. Mental emotional component is huge. Um, nervous system is huge. And if you're not getting better, keep digging. There's always something else to try. There's someone else to ask. Um, natural medicine is great in that way that we always have another step or someone else that we can send you to. If, if I've um, gone through all of my ideas and possibilities, then I will send you to someone who knows more than I do. So I think that is it, unless there is any other questions for me. Uh, I don't have any questions in the chat right now, but okay. we will have time at the end for more if people think of some. Okay. I had a question, but whenever it's time. Cool. Uh, I, do you want to ask it now or Sangeeta? Yeah, that's fine. Go right ahead. Sure. Thanks. I just was curious if you do like a short 5, 10, 15 minute uh, call to if someone has a little more complex case just to see if it's something you would want to take on or not or that you have experience with that because sometimes yep. you do all this build up for a big appointment and then <laughs> you know, it's not a good match for some. yep absolutely I think it's also important that when people are dealing with chronic complex issues they've often been through many doctors and I think it's important that you find someone that you have rapport with and that you trust. So not only someone that you think is clinically good at what they do, um, but someone you like. Because if you're going to be working with someone for you know, a year, potentially, um, you want to have some rapport with that person. So yes, absolutely. I, I always do free calls. OK, free thanks. Calls. And just a quick follow up. I mean, you say six months to a year, which is very reasonable. Um, but sometimes. I mean, I hope it doesn't take six months to notice improvement, especially no. when you're suffering with a bunch of symptoms. Sometimes no. you can see those sooner. What I typically tell people is you should be feeling some shift in the first three months, um, if not sooner. And it really depends what we're dealing with. You know, if someone has chronic 20, 30 year Lyme disease, they might just be sleeping a little better at the three month mark, which can seem miraculous. Um, mm -hmm. But if it's something simpler than that, Sometimes people are better in a month or two. I just don't like to promise that up front. <laughs> I like to give people the expectation that within three months, we should feel like we're headed in the right direction and something should be better. And within six months to a year, depending on the condition, you should be better and lab work should look better. Okay, thank you. I'll look forward mm -hmm. to uh, connecting with you. Yeah. All right, Alexa, it's all you.
I can't hear anybody. Oh, I muted myself, sorry. <laughs> Did you have another question? It looks like you were trying to say something. No, I just couldn't hear Alexis if she was talking. I she's muted. So. No, I muted myself too. Okay, now can you hear me? <laughs> I mute myself now. We are experts at everything except Zoom. Okay. All right, cool. So we are now going to talk about the homeopathic perspective um, of menopause. And this is really about, as Sangeeta said, menopause happens to every living woman. And, it, and it's a natural process. The thing is it, menopause itself is not bad. It's the disruptions that come that are, that are, can be mildly or very uh, disrupting to people's lives. And so this is the thing we're trying to ease as we go forward. So first, I always like to talk about what homeopathy is for anybody listening who is not familiar with it. So we'll take three or four minutes and just talk about that. Um, so homeopathy is a specific branch of alternative medicine different than acupuncture and naturopathy and um, is a very specific uh, modality in which we use homeopathic remedies. They're formulated especially homeopathically, which is different than buying herbs or creams or supplements. They um, are formulated in a special way. There are over 3,000 homeopathic remedies, and you probably have heard of Arnica. It's the most widely known. And in homeopathy, we choose a remedy for each person uniquely based on symptoms that you are expressing, whether it's acute or chronic. So it's an energetic medicine. It's minute diluted doses of the 3000 different substances from which remedies are made that stimulate your vitality and body systems to return your body to health. So those remedies are not going in there and doing something to your body. They're actually stimulating your body to return itself to health. Because in chronic disease, we are stuck in a pattern and the body cannot return itself to health due to some kind of dysfunction or disharmony or sometimes some out, outer maintaining cause. And so the remedies stimulate your body to be able to return you back to health just in the same way that homeostasis works. Homeopathy is gentle, there are no side effects, and it's safe for all ages and conditions. It's effective, inexpensive, non-toxic, green medicine that is widely available at health, health, health food stores and online. And it is based on simple principles. And so what are those simple principles? So how does it work? So homeopathy is based on a principle first observed and documented in 400 BC by a scientist named Paracelsus who coined the term the law of similars. And this states simply like cures like. So what does that mean? That sounds like a confusing phrase. It means that we match a patient's symptoms to the known symptoms of a remedy. So we say these symptoms that the patient is having and these symptoms that we know a remedy produces are alike. And then the remedy cures the symptoms. So for example, here's an example of like cures like. We know that a bee sting has these common symptoms. We know that it's red, it's hot, it's swollen, it's got stinging, burning pain. We've all had a bee sting, we know how it feels. You can see the picture, it's red, it's got a circular swelling in the middle. Um, and so what we need to do is find a remedy with these, this list of symptoms, and the symptoms of the bee sting will be neutralized. So we look around in our Materia Medica, which is our encyclopedia of remedies, and we find Apis Malefica. This is a remedy made from a bee. And these are descriptions that come right out of our encyclopedia of remedies for apis that says that apis treats swellings after bites or stings, stinging pain, hives, burning, stinging, itching, redness of skin with sensitivity, edematous swellings, and that it's a specific for insect stings or bites. Now you could see that those symptoms could treat other things besides a bee sting. For example, if you had an allergic reaction and you got hives, 
that could also fall into the category of these symptoms. So when we give APIS to a person who's exhibiting these symptoms, in this case, the bee sting, it relieves the pain, swelling, and redness in just a few minutes because the symptoms of the remedy and the symptoms of the patient are alike. And this is the basic principle of like cures like. So this, what I'm talking about with a bee sting, is an acute condition. Um, an acute condition or illness arises and resolves in a short time. And homeopathy can be used effectively by anyone in acute situations with the right training and tools. Um, all you need to know is what remedy do I give someone when they have the flu or um, conjunctivitis? Um, but what about conditions that arise and don't resolve or conditions that stay for months or years or that you were born with? These are chronic problems. As I said just a moment ago, when your, your body is stuck in a cycle and cannot bring itself back into health, that is a chronic problem. And homeopathy excels at treating chronic illness because it really um, gets to the foundation of why your body is out of balance and then brings it back into balance holistically. So homeopathy's role in the resolution of chronic illness is to restore harmony and balance to the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. And when I say spirit, I mean your energy, your vitality, your zest for life. Chronic cases are treated using the very same principle of like cures like, just like the bee sting. So however, it's complex. We need to take into account all of these symptoms, mind, body, and spirit. So it's best to work with a professional rather than treating yourself. So for example, these are some examples of chronic issues, which of course, this is a very limited list. It goes on and on. But any kind of chronic infections, menstrual pain, menopause symptoms like we're talking about today, migraines, allergies, asthma, eczema, sleep disorders, mood swings, anxiety, depression, persistent thoughts, fears, low self-worth. All of these things are chronic issues, unlike, say, the flu, poison oak, uh, you dropped a hammer on your toe. Those are acute conditions that are easy to treat yourself at home with homeopathy. So Chronic homeopathic treatment supports women's health in four ways. First, it eliminates or improves the symptoms of your chief complaint, whatever that may be. In this case, we're talking about perimenopause symptoms, but it could be anything, of course. It improves and supports mental emotional health simultaneously. It improves and supports whole body health beyond the chief complaint. So this is not targeted treatment that only focuses on one organ or one complaint like, oh, my elbow hurts. It treats the whole body. And then fourth, it supports healing in the glands directly. So if there's some imbalance that is causing a problem that's chronic, we are supporting the glands to be able to function normally so that then you don't continue to need medicine or even remedies in the long term. So tonight we're going to be talking about chronic care of the disruptions of menopause. And my slides overlap with Sangeeta's a little bit, so I won't spend too much time on it. But some facts that Sangeeta already brought up, it's defined by the absence of a menstrual period for one full year. Most women experience menopause between the ages of 40 and 58, which is quite a span, but the average is 51. So this period of hormone change and instability is called perimenopause and is really the issue that people have with these, alter, these varying and decreasing levels of hormones. So it can begin years before the final menstrual period. So people could be suffering with these issues for four to eight years, which is why it's such a, a big problem. So perimenopause and menopause affect all living women, but with varying levels of disruption, just as we were talking about, because there are different um, underlying states that are going on from a health perspective that can affect it. So as you saw, this is really variations in the levels of estrogen and progesterone. And so we've already seen that. So some common symptoms that you've already talked about. 
Um, irregular periods, skipping, changing cycle lengths, hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, worsening PMS, trouble sleeping, difficulty getting to sleep and waking in the night, a very common problem I deal with, breast tenderness, lowered sex drive, vaginal atrophy, leading to painful sex, uh, urine leakage when coughing or sneezing, and urinary urgency. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, and so we're going to talk right now about some remedies that can help these particular issues. So in this moment, we're talking about it from a chronic standpoint. So somebody might come to me and say, I've got uh, problems with perimenopause and my biggest issue is that I have hot flashes. And then I would be thinking to myself, let's look at this selection of remedies, lachesis, sepia, belladonna, simisifuga, staphysagria. These are remedies that are known for their hot flashes as the predominant symptom of perimenopause. And other, somebody else might say, you know what, for me, it's night sweats. And then there might be a different set of remedies that I would look at. And I just want to call your attention to, by the way, simisifuga is black cohosh. So some of these remedies actually translate into the herbal world where, where um, we can use them homeopathically and we can use them herbally to support women's health. So let's say somebody, their biggest issue is mood swings. Um, pulsatilla, lachesis, calc carb, chamomilla, sepia might be some of the ones that I would be thinking of. Trouble sleeping, here is another set. Lowered sex drive, yet another set. Vaginal atrophy, another set. And then urine leakage. Now you'll see that on, in our complicated page here that we're seeing some of the same remedies over and over. We see lachesis, we see sepia, pulsatilla, staphysagria, natrum muriaticum. These, that's because these are really excellent remedies for women's health and specifically hormonal issues in, in particular. And in our previous lectures um, Sangeet, that Sangeet and I have given on thyroid and adrenal support, as well as the one about um, menstrual issues, I've talked about sepia before, I've talked about natrum muriaticum, calc carb. So we're gonna talk about some different ones tonight but first, I wanted to tell you about what you could do yourself, some acute remedies that you could use at home if you were having trouble with these particular issues. So let's say hot flashes are your particular problem. Lachesis is an excellent remedy for hot flashes, and it's something that you can use acutely, and that would be to say, huh, I have hot flashes, let me try lachesis. We might not be expecting a global response from that, but it could help your hot flashes in the moment. Maybe you're not ready to go see a homeopath to get a full consult, and you just want a little support. You're seeing Sangeeta, you're taking some herbs, you're doing some diagnostic testing to figure out what's underlying it. So you could take lachesis, you could try taking lachesis before bed every night for a week, for example, and see how it works for you. I said before bed, but of course, hot, that's because I had hot flashes at night in bed. Um, but of course, people have hot flashes all throughout the day. So maybe you'd want to take it in the morning. It would depend on your particular situation. Let's say night sweats were your problem. Phosphorus is something that you could try. That would be something that you could try before bed. If you have trouble sleeping, in particular, caffea cruda, the remedy that's highlighted here, is excellent for having a hard time going to sleep because of racing or excited thoughts that are in your head. Maybe like the minute you lie down, you just, your brain starts going. Caffea is excellent. It is not a not by chance that it is made from coffee because it has like cures like, right? Coffee creates this kind of stimulation, which is the same thing that it cures. If you have urine leakage when coughing, sneezing, or say jumping on a trampoline, something I never do anymore, you could try the remedy Squilla. And that's an excellent remedy for that. Of course, um, there are exercises you can do for that as well, and that can be part of a greater picture. Um, but these, so these are four remedies that you could try at home for one of these problems. The, for the most part, what we, the rest of what we're going to be talking about is 
going to a professional and what that person might give you and what sort of a person are you. So, because in chronic care, it's all about finding the right remedy for you and your symptoms. And you might be having sleep problems, hot flashes and mood swings, and someone else might be having low sex drive, weepiness and headaches, right? We just, it depends. And, and as I said in the beginning, homeopathic remedies are chosen for you specifically. So I can't say as a blanket statement, everyone's going to do great on lachesis. As you will see, lachesis is a very specific kind of remedy. So in our highlight of chronic remedies, today we're going to be talking about lachesis, pulsatilla, sepia, and staphysagria. Now I did already talk about uh, sepia in a previous lecture, but it's so important for this hormonal uh, time, this time of hormonal change. Um, I just wanted to talk about it again. So first we're going to talk about lachesis. So lachesis is made from snake venom and it's, I tried to find the friendliest picture of lachesis that I could. Um, it is not a concern that snake venom, uh, snake venom is not a concern because they're micro doses. So it is non-toxic, it's diluted and remember it's energetic medicine. So it's not the toxicity of the uh, substance is not a concern uh, in terms of it being poisonous. And if anybody has any questions about that, please go ahead and interrupt me. So the mental state of Lachesis is a woman who is very passionate. She works hard and competes intensely. She's intense and dramatic. Perhaps her friends might say she's theatrical. She has an inner mental stimulation that just comes out in her manner and speech, making her very loquacious and talkative. Her mind is full of ideas that she can't keep to herself and they must be expressed, which means you can't get a word in edgewise. Sometimes she can have anger and aggressiveness and seek revenge if she feels like she's been wronged. So she has a kind of um, territorial quality about her. There can be jealousy, possessiveness of her partner, her territory. She can be suspicious. Now this might seem like what? How could somebody be territorial? But I'll tell you what, I have a um, curb in front of my house and I feel somehow as if this curb belongs to me and nobody else should park there. So my neighbor often parks in front of my house in my curb and I feel very territorial about it. And so this is just an example. Maybe I need lachesis, maybe I don't, but it is an example of a feeling of territorialness that maybe um, you hadn't thought of before. So lachesis can also be quite sarcastic and hurtful. If you think of a snake striking, if she feels hurt, she can then turn and be hurtful. Also, there can be a feeling of guilt and lachesis can be very anxious or even deeply phobic of different things. Um, and as we saw in Sangeeta's presentation, anxiety can be one of the symptoms that you can feel in perimenopause. Often there is a history of grief or disappointed love in lachesis. Now the physical state of lachesis, hot flashes, as I mentioned with sweating and face flushing, um, the period can be too profuse, too frequent, just too much. M incredible PMS with irritability, jealousy, depression, headache, hot flashes, like everything gets worse before the period because of that hormonal change. <coughs> Excuse me. Involuntary urination, especially with coughing. Ovarian tumors or cysts severe period pain, unable to bear clothing, and then better once the flow starts. It's a similar metaphor to the talking. When unable to talk, she gets worse. But then once that flow of talking starts, she feels much better. This is why she's constantly having to share her ideas. She can have a high sex drive. Um, headaches are a big uh, symptom of, of laxis, migraines, worse before the period, worse at menopause, 
Hyperthyroidism is often an issue with the heat and the palpitations, um, the opposite of hypothyroidism. Sore throats are a chronic issue for Lachesis patients and most snake remedies. It can be chronic or acute, especially worse on the left side. And a keynote of Lachesis is there is an intolerance to tight collars, turtlenecks, necklaces, scarves, anything that feels tight around the neck because the neck with the sore throats and the neck is a very, uh, there's a very strong affinity for that part of the body with lachesis. Even tight things around the belt or the waist, um, I often see that in lachesis clients. Asthma, worse at night, worse during sleep. Oftentimes symptoms in lachesis are worse, uh, fine when they go to sleep, worse when waking up. So they feel worse when they wake up, whatever it may be and there can be palpitations. Okay, any questions about laxus? All right, we're gonna talk about our friendly animal remedy, the sepia, which is the cuttlefish. Uh, sepia is made from cuttlefish ink. Very, very common remedy for women that I see in all stages of life, girls, uh, teens, pregnant women, it's just, it, menopausal women, women in between. It's, it's fantastic. So sepia is a very sensitive person. And being so, she's very overwhelmed by the demands of life, as well as particularly the demands of motherhood, because the demands of motherhood are, I need your body, I need your attention, I need you to hold me and hug me even when you don't feel like it. There are, there are many physical and spiritual demands on mothers. And it can be very overwhelming for a really sensitive person. And so she compensates by building a wall around herself and becomes easily irritable and overwhelmed, gets angry, yells at the kids, yells at her husband, starts to feel disconnected and indifferent to her family, even angry and averse to her family, like just wants to get away from them. Like everything about them is annoying. And then she can start making mean, sarcastic comments that just cut everybody right to the quick. And I have had clients say to me, I just, I hate that I do that. I just can't help it. I can't help myself because she just wants to be alone. Like the world is just way too much stimulation, too much, need to go off for a run on Mount Tam or lock myself in the bathroom for a bath. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey Alexis, we have a yeah. question. Oh yeah. It's, it's a little off topic, but um, okay. actually a couple of questions. So about sepia specifically, there's a question, is the mental state of sepia constant or only during PMS? Mm, okay, so when I'm describing sepia or lachesis or any remedy, I'm talking about the global picture. So let's say you have a very sensitive person, but soon we're going to talk about the sensitivity of sepia to hormonal shifts. So that means that maybe she's okay until right before her period. And then because she's so sensitive to those hormonal changes, she starts to get more irritated and overwhelmed. So it's a continuum of looking globally, but then looking at the different things that might aggravate. Sorry, I have a tickle in my throat. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we're talking about uh, situations that get better and worse depending on aggravating factors. And then there's another question. This one's a little off topic from sepia, but um, Barb asked if you consider chronic infections like Lyme or mold illness an obstacle to cure in homeopathy, or do you feel these can be treated, addressed with a constitutional remedy? <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm having this tickle in my throat. Terrible timing. Um, I do not think it was Lyme and what else? Mold, she just said chronic infections and the example was um, Lyme or mold toxicity. Um, so I think those are two different things. I would say that Lyme disease is a an infection that you would want to treat homeopathically and potentially with other modalities. 
it's not a, a maintaining cause or an, it, it may be an obstacle to cure, but it may be the thing that needs to be cured, if that makes sense. Mold toxicity, I think, is a different thing because that implies that you are being exposed to mold. And yes, that is an obstacle to cure or a maintaining cause. You would want to get away from the mold because mold is so toxic and affects so many different systems of the body and really... Um, how much can we do with all those mycotoxins pouring into your body? Not to say that we can't do anything, but it's helpful to remove toxins from your environment, especially if you know for sure that you're having a problem with them. Let me know if that doesn't answer it entirely. Okay. Um, did I see more? more questions coming in? Okay. Sorry, I was muted. Um, <clears throat> no, no more questions. She just said, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And um, mold and Lyme are definitely different things. <laughs> yes, for sure. Both terrible, but different. Okay, good. So sepia um, likes to keep busy and occupied and especially likes stimulation. So physical and mental stimulation dancing, thunderstorms, like running out in the thunderstorm, loving that vibrant excitement, vigorous exercise, no gentle walks for sepia. Sepia wants to go out, you know, downhilling or, you know, hardcore running, really getting that exercise to stimulate the body. And here we go, better from a need for vigorous exercise. And there is this feeling like, I just want my body to myself. You know, you've been clinging and nursing all day long, and I just don't want you to touch me. And that includes you, husband, and so no sex for you. <clears throat> um, she can weep without knowing why, because she's so sensitive. This is just happening to her. It's not, she doesn't mean to be this way. It's just happening to her because of this level of sensitivity. So the physical symptoms of sepia could hardly be um, summarized on one slide here, but just from a, from a perimenopause standpoint, sepia is very affected by normal hormonal changes and fluctuations, which really ha happen starting at age, well, it used to be age 14, now it's age 10, 11, 12, um, when a girl gets her first period, when she gets pregnant, when she um, is breastfeeding and stops breastfeeding and every cycle, all, all of that is very, um, it affects her very much on a mental level as well as a physical level. So that means that there are problems arising right from the first period, from menopause in the cycle, and especially these birth control uh, methods that involve hormones, those can be very disrupting for a person with this kind of sensitivity. And sepia can be have terrible PMS due to this with irritability, depression, weeping, and all of those mental symptoms that we talked about can get worse. Um, menstrual pain can be extreme with a heavy pushing out feeling like that uterus is just going to fall right out. I got to cross my legs to keep it from, from falling out. A lot of vaginitis, yeast infections with white discharges, and painful sex due to dry, vaginal dryness. The period can be anything too early, too profuse, too prolonged, in between. There are myriad problems with the period. Hot flashes with excessive perspiration. And I want to say that a person who needs sepia might not have every single one of these symptoms. It might just be like, oh yeah, it's the hot flashes, and every time I get my period, I have such bad PMS. So, it, so when I'm reading these lists, this is a, giving you a global picture, but it's not every single symptom. You know, you match the person to the symptoms that they have, and we say, aha, sepia has the symptom. We don't worry about the symptoms that the person doesn't have. Often sore breasts, which are another sign of hormonal imbalances, Stress incontinence with sneezing, coughing, jumping on a trampoline. <clears throat> None of my friends jump on trampolines anymore. I don't know about you. Um, and many skin conditions, psoriasis, vitiligo, eczema, 
Um, in young girls, I see a lot of skin issues. Morning sickness, it's a huge morning sickness remedy. I wish every woman knew about CPF or morning sickness. There should be no more morning sickness. With homeopathy, that, that could be true. Uh, hypothyroidism with cold hands and feet, constipation and sallow skin. So when I talked about sepia before, it was in the context of the thyroid. It's also an excellent thyroid remedy. And this is pulsatilla. So pulsatilla um, is mild. It's this beautiful little flower down here, the wind flower. Mild, emotional, tearful, impressionable, soft, open, weepy woman who can be sad or depressed and have mood swings. There is a quality of changeability in pulsatilla, but generally is a person very sweet, craving affection and sympathy, and has sort of a deep feeling of being unloved. You know, do you love me? Needs reassurance about being loved. Wants to be consoled, wants to be reassured, and then that makes everything better. So kids who need pulsatilla, often are weepy, clingy, ask mommy, do you love me? And then that makes everything better. Um, irritability, especially before the period, jealousy, disgust. And then the physical symptoms, night sweats, irregular, changeable menses, bleeding between the periods, painful periods, especially at the beginning of puberty, endometriosis, involuntary urination, lots of bladder infections, and a lot of indigestion, especially from rich food, which again could point to an issue with the liver and gallbladder, just as we were talking about with Sangeeta. Bloating and abdominal distension, same thing. Some kind of dysfunction going on in the gut. Headaches with nausea and vomiting. Morning sickness again. Hay fever, ear infections, and then chronic nasal obstruction with bland and greenish nasal discharge. I see that a lot in kids. Staphysagria is the last remedy we're gonna talk about. This is a sweet and accommodating person who is a people pleaser, very sensitive, sentimental, romantic, history of multiple griefs, history of suppressed emotions. Usually this person was told their emotions were not acceptable, like anger is not acceptable, you can only be happy, and I see this a lot in my practice, so they've suppressed their anger, and when I say, tell me about your anger, they say, oh, I'm never angry. I don't get angry, and uh, of course, that's not true. They do get angry. They just don't experience it, uh, so they don't have any reflection on what it, what it is. Um, they're very sensitive to insults or humiliation, and then when they're pushed to the very limit, they throw things and get very angry. So they have nothing, nothing, nothing. And then it just, it's like the pressure cooker explodes. They tend to have low self-esteem, low self-worth, depression, and they hang on to terrible marriages and relationships with justifications um, that they, they should stay for some reason. And they can have trembling with their humiliation or their emotion. And often a history of abuse or alcoholic parents, which is why that is the pattern that leads to those suppressed emotions and like it's only okay to be perfect and and not be angry like anger is a bad emotion so the physical symptoms of staphysagria can be irregular periods of all types absent period vaginal discharge painful sensitivity of the genital organs ovarian pains painful sex aversion to sex or high sex drive a lot of issues with sex, as you can see, uh, bladder infections, especially after sex. In fact, um, this is an excellent remedy if that's a pattern of always having a bladder infection after you have sex, Staphysagria is excellent for that. Hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, this just looks like perimenopause. And then psoriasis, constipation. Sorry, I zipped past that a little fast. Um, but really, it's all about finding the right remedy for you. As I've said, everyone is in a unique state made up of the totality of their symptoms as I take the case. So we're looking for your symptoms that make up the stars of your constellation. And then when we find that totality, we find the remedy that matches you best. So I know we're running out of time. So I'm going to go through my case pretty quick. So this is a 49-year-old woman 
with her chief complaint of perimenopausal problems. Trouble sleeping due to anxious thoughts, waking in the night, trouble getting back to sleep, loss of libido, no interest in sex, I'm never in the mood, irregular periods, uh, recently she skipped it for four months, PMS every month even though she's not having a period, flow is very heavy, last seven days, which is kind of long, cramping, can't even stand up straight, especially in the lower back, headache during the period with pain in the back of her head, and the occiput where like she was hit by a shovel. She's having hot flashes, especially on her back. And she's hypothyroid, but she just found that out in some routine blood work. So she's not experiencing any particular symptoms. She has high cholesterol and has UTIs, that's a urinary tract infection, one per year, so not so often, but they're very extreme, really terrible, painful, blood-tinged urine, low back pain, which does indicate some kidney involvement. So her mental emotional state, she's in a difficult marriage. She's committed, but it's not easy. And the most difficult thing is fighting with her husband about sex. She stays in the relationship even though she doesn't feel un loved unconditionally. She actually feels disappointed, hollow, cold, empty, and vacant inside. Those were the words she used. When she gets angry, she screams, hits, and throws things when she's really pushed to her limit. Otherwise, she's quite accommodating because her husband's a difficult person. She's aggravated by sound, and she's grieving still the death of her mother and father 17 years ago. She describes herself as an orphan um, and as if that was it. She lost, now she doesn't belong to any family at all. Her coping mechanism is to shut off the outside world and swimming does this perfectly for her. She goes to the pool and she's underwater. She can't um, hear anything. She just feels all alone. It feels so good. So my observation was that she was very light, very sort of laughing about what seemed to me to be very serious matters, talking about her husband and the difficulties they were having. So we're going to look for the totality of her symptoms. And I know this chart is like confusing for you to look at, but on the left are the symptoms that I put in, the grief, sensitivities, throwing, um, talkativeness. And then at the top, we see the remedies that come up with those symptoms. And this is the totality. And we see staphysagria, lachesis, belladonna, sepia, natrum muriaticum, lots of remedies up there, but some of the ones that we've talked about today. And so I ended up giving her staphysagria. This is made from the delphinium plant, such a beautiful flower. So her first follow-up after one month, she said, I felt unusually happy two to three days after the first dose. I felt effervescent. This is always a good thing when someone says they feel effervescent. Um, I was cheerful, laughing, patient. My period was better than usual, not so crampy, less worried thoughts. And she tells me about some dreams. I dreamt about my parents. I felt sadness and grief, but it made me feel connected to my mom. And then she dreamt about a very sick huge dying animal laying in the middle of a classroom and everyone was being polite, trying to ignore it, stepping and working around it. Like she described this animal like pussy and oozing all over the floor. Like it was really, really um, disgusting. And then she said, do you think that means I'm trying to get out of a bad situation that I feel stuck in? And she said it in this very laughing kind of jokey way. And I thought, could be, right? So then after three months, um, she says, I have good energy, anxious thoughts at night have disappeared completely. My mood and my PMS are not too bad. Hot flashes and night waking are continuing. I had a dream of drowning and she started telling me <clears throat> that her relationship with her husband is still affecting her very negatively and deeply. And yet she's currently determined to make the best of her marriage. My observation was that she was less light and laughing and seemed a little bit more angry, although she kept it tightly reserved. And while that may not seem good, to me, that's a really good thing when a person doesn't express appropriate emotions about a situation and then I see them expressing appropriate emotions, to me, that's a step towards health. Even if anger is not a pleasant thing for me to experience or you to experience, 
it's important to be able to feel angry when the situation warrants it. After six months, she said she had a bladder infection, return of an old symptom, and that means a return of an old symptom is my note, that's not what she said. But when we do have chronic problems, sometimes they return in kind of a shadow form, in a kind of a lesser form, and we just let them pass. We don't really treat them. Um, maybe we treat them acutely with a remedy, but then the cycle is broken and you don't get infections anymore. And this is infections of all kinds. Hot flashes are gone, mood is improved, less anger and irritability, energy level is good, sleep much improved, night waking is gone, anxiety and bad thoughts are improved, relationship is the same. I'm pissed at him for his attitude uh, and he doesn't appreciate me. However, I got a new job, which has given me financial um, independence, and I'm delighted to be so appreciated. So I got a letter from her. She said, I so appreciate all you've done for me. I feel like my PMS symptoms have improved overall, particularly the feeling of uncontrollable grumpiness and hostility that I was feeling which was hidden, I think. It was hidden underneath this very light, friendly outside. I feel more balanced and in control. Working at my job is helping my sense of self-worth and getting some of my identity back. You've really helped me with my transition to the start of menopause, and I feel better prepared for the journey. And a few years later, she left her husband and decided to just find a peaceful life on her own. Um, and that is really the story of Staphysagria. And so what we can do is say, how can we say that this treatment supported her? Did it eliminate or improve the symptoms of her chief complaint? Yes. Did it improve and support her mental emotional health? Yes. And I didn't mention this before, but oftentimes when people have these dreams, um, especially she told me about a lot of her dreams in great detail and people who um, relate to their dreams in that way often have healing in their dreams and they dream about symbolic things that are important that progress them along and i think the dream about the dead animal that everyone was avoiding was a dream about her marriage and that she just wasn't ready to see that she needed that it was toxic in her life, um, but she was dreaming about it, which tells me that the remedy was working at a very fundamental level to show her what she needed to see, to allow her to feel what she needed to feel. Um, did it improve and support her whole body health beyond the chief complaint? Yes. And did it support healing in her glands directly? Yes, because that's how um, we, her body was able to regulate the problems that she was having with her hot flashes and her perimenopause symptoms. And these are just some of the remedies that we talked about before. And I will just second what Sangeeta said about many things, which is that your, your body needs more than just a remedy um, or just an herb or just a supplement or a hormone replacement to feel good. You have to remove the things that are obstacles to cure. That could be diet, lifestyle, it could be something else. But if there's something making you sick, it, you need to take that out in order to bring about health. Stress reduction cannot be emphasized enough. Stress is such a massive problem um, for every single person in my practice and everybody that I know and everybody in the world, I think. Um, it, it is, cortisol is the ca causes inflammation um, and so many other things. So having a regular daily practice of stress reduction is essential. Whoops, sorry. Um, eating whole healthy foods, including good fats, uh, exercise and movement, is really, really important. And if you like it, it's even more beneficial. So it's worth taking the time to figure out, do I like stand up paddling? Do I like rock climbing? Do I like running? Do I like, what do you like? And figure out what it is and do it. You need play time. You need time to connect with your friends, your children, your spouse, and you need radical downtime. And this goes in with the stress um, meditation, maybe doing nothing, maybe just daydreaming. It's really, really important that we take the time to do that. Um, it, it activates parts of the brain that only get activated during that time, which is really important for our mental emotional health, as well as our creativity and um, mental function. 
So these are some resources. You will get these in the slides if you are interested in learning more about um, doing acute care at home. Um, and then this is my contact info, but I can stop sharing. I guess I have to escape first, we'll escape. I'll stop sharing and we can ask any questions that you guys have. Oh. All right, it looks like everybody had to run at seven. I ran over. Oh, you're muted. I'm the last one standing. You are. You have any <laughs> last, last questions for us? No, I just love all of this. I, I think my, my particular case is likely um, both chronic, constitutional, ho however you want to, you know, say it. So um, I love learning, just putting some pieces together. And I want to go take sepia right now, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you're speaking to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know what? So many people need sepia. It's it's so yeah. common. It's such a common remedy. It really <laughs> is. I use it a lot too. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you both for your time. I yeah. really appreciate it. I love these. I love these classes, these webinars. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, we have you're fun welcome. doing them. <laughs> Great. Um, all right, good. Well, right. great to see you, Bob.